All right, guys, sorry I'm a little bit late. I had some technical issues to work through, but they are handled now. So um, thank you so much for tuning in. I see there's a few of you in here already, and that always makes me happy. It's always great to start the day out with a bunch of people already in the room. Now, I don't know. I'm hoping this is going to Facebook and YouTube. As I said, that's the new program I'm using. It should be. If it's not, it's not my fault. I'm using a program called Ecamm Live. When it works great, it works great. And when it doesn't, then there's, there's other issues, but um, nothing I can really do about that. So um, today I want to really focus on your questions again, as I always do in these Q&As. But I also want to focus on, um, you know, the ethics in dog training. I think it's always something I talk about, and it's always something that's really important to talk about because it's something that people oftentimes um, overlook. And that is, you know, people look for help in training a dog, whether you're a member of, this, uh, of my, my online training at, uh, you know, on robertcabral.com or not. A lot of times people want an extra help with their dogs uh, and they need a, a trainer or, you know, somebody to kind of give them a little bit of extra leeway. And when that is whether they're doing protection work or, um, you know, just, just training their dogs, their regular pet dogs, the issue often comes in, you know, and, and a friend of mine, Larry Crone talked about it on this thing is, you know, people who are brilliant at marketing oftentimes will get clients and, not necessarily do the best thing by the dog. And there's just this big debate and conversation going on. And Larry and I had it on, on, on the podcast once, and that was dealing with, um, should, you know, the idea of making a lot of money as a dog trainer. Now there's nothing wrong with making a good living as a dog trainer. I have done that and continue to do that, but that shouldn't be your outset goal. Right. If your goal is to and this comes really in, in most businesses, if your goal is to make a lot of money, oftentimes customer service will lack. I read a book a long time ago by a guy named Zig Ziglar, who really influenced my life. And he said that you can get everything you want in life if you just help enough other people get what they want. So that was always my motto in, you know, whether it was teaching karate or photography or bodyguarding or now, dog training is I can get the success I want to get if I help enough other people get what they want, which is a well-trained dog, learning martial arts, or whatever that would be. And that's really critical, that, that we need to look at that. For those of you who are in here who are dog trainers, um, is your ethics, is, is how do you present yourself? Is your goal to do 10 sessions a day or you know eight sessions a day and, you know, get as much as you can and go from client to client to client. Or are you the guy who's going to stay after? And that was my issue. I just never booked that many sessions so that when it came time for me to train a dog, um, I would do the session and let's say a, a lot an hour, an hour and a half for that session. If the dog or the person wasn't getting it, I would just stay. You know, I, would, I wouldn't really limit the session by the time. I would limit the session by... Um, getting my donut off my face here that I ate just before I got on. Um, I would, I would really focus on what I could get across to the person. And that was really crucial for me to, um, really always focus on when it came to, you know, doing what I did is, is just to give the people everything they needed. And I still do that when I do sessions, I don't really time them. Sometimes they're short. Sometimes, you know, I can get what I want to get across to a client in 20, 30 minutes. Sometimes it takes an hour and a half, but that's, you know, and again, I should be compensated for my time. I understand that. But I set a price that, you know, that is fair and agreed upon in advance. And then we go from there. But anyway, I'm, I'm digressing. Be sure if you are a dog trainer, check out my online dog training at robertcabral.com, but also check out shelterdogtraining.com, which is an online course that's geared really specifically for dog trainers. And it's something that I want um, people to have access to because, it's something I created when I was working with Bound Angels and then created shelter programs, behavior programs in shelters, which were honestly the most unique type of training scenarios that you could possibly imagine. They were always geared with dogs that I knew nothing about. I would literally would open the kennel and the dog could be Cujo coming out to attack me or it could be the most submissive sweet dog in the world or anything in between. So shelter dogs are always a great place. The number one advice I always give to people is if you want to be a great dog trainer, then um, look for honing your skills in a dog trainer or in a, in a dog shelter, an animal shelter, or with rescue dogs, because they are 
kind of the most unique um, behavior concoction you can possibly imagine. So anyway, that's that. Let me um, go through the comments. Um, and, and hello to all of you everywhere in the world that are tuning in. I'm always um, so happy to see people tuning in from all over the world. Warms my heart to see that people are training dogs um, in Pakistan, in, in, in England, in you know the United States, in Mexico, Canada, uh, wherever you're from, Ireland. I see so many of you. Um, let's get to the questions. Uh, so Hollis, put them on the screen today. Um, when does Velcro healing turn into points off for crowding? Well, healing in um, whether it's AKC or IGP, uh, it, it, now in, in the ring sports, it's not, I don't think it's judged as strictly, and I'm not 100% sure because I'm not a ring sport guy, but healing in either AKC or IGP, the dog can't touch you. The dog has to be next to you. Now, in the transport, um, and I'm just reading a fantastic book on it by Peter Scherk, um, in the transport, you want the dog slightly touching you slightly touching you right that's making somewhat contact with you and i know in the ring sports that you have touch healing so when you're doing a defensive handler and stuff like that the dog should be uh, touching you so during healing dog shouldn't touch you but during uh, something like a transport or any of those things then the dog can be touching and then as long as the dog's not pushing your knee into you i don't think you would receive points off um remember what i said please all of you guys if you don't have a question mark in front of your question, I'm probably not going to get to it because we've got 180 people, 160 people in here now, and it'll grow quite a bit. And it's the only thing. I, I mean, if you guys want to talk amongst each other or say hi, I'll, I'm not going to waste the time of everybody else to, to, to do that. I appreciate you being here. They'll understand that. Brian says, uh, my one-year-old intact male shepherd gets his nose stuck on a scent while on our walks. What's the best way to get his attention off of it? Um, and that is usually to be more exciting. I try not to overcorrect the dog for that because it's a natural instinct of the dog. However, when it becomes obsessive and the dog goes into prey drive and just starts blowing you off, then you can put a correction on it. But the, the way to start it out is to be more exciting, to be more um, uh, you know, interesting than the scent. I, I see one thing in here, and I don't even know what it means when somebody puts it, because I've got all these things across the top, like thumbs up, heart, um, another thumbs up. So I'm assuming now we've got Facebook in here as well. So um, so, so when, it, when the dog gets completely checked out, then I would give him a pop. Hey, hey. Um, but make sure your walk is meaningful. A lot of times we meander on our walks and we're slow. And I see people all the time, like on their phone, walking dogs, it drives me absolutely batty. Pay attention to your dog on a walk. That's really, really important. Um, Let's see. Um, Janet's not here today. She's act, she's um, she's predisposed. She'll be back later, so she's not going to answer any questions either. Um, there is no subject here. It's just Q and A. Um, but I would like to focus more on uh, ethics and dog training. If you guys have any questions, I'll give those priority um, about dog trainers, ethics in dog training, the eth efficacy of dog training what we should look for in dog trainers and all that. I'd like to talk a lot more about that, especially since I've launched the shelter dog training program. Um, I'd like to make sure to make available to everyone um, as much information as possible about dog trainers and dog training. Uh, Gil says, what should I do if a dog won't let you pull, put a collar on him? He growls and tries to bite. Well, you need to desensitize the dog to the collar first, right? And the way I do that usually is um, lay the, the collar on the ground, bunch of treats, bunch of petting, a bunch of playing, let the dog see the collar, um, pet the dog, hold the collar in your hand while you're petting the dog, while you're playing with the dog, get, get the dog neutral to the presence of the collar. And then what I would probably do is I would probably start with a, um, a slip lead because a slip lead, you can kind of have really wide open. You can slip it over the dog's neck and get the dog used to it. So, and then I wouldn't put the stopper down because it might be hard to get the stopper uh, off again to get it off the dog. So I would use a slip lead. I'd put it on the dog get it snug, work the dog around, take it off, put it on, but get the dog really desensitized to the presence of that slip lead first. Um, and I, I would definitely go with the slip lead first. I wouldn't even go with the collar. But it's a great question. BD, how do I get my Mel to become more active when playing tug? She grabs, grasps on with a firm, deep bite, but that's it. She doesn't shake. Well, first of all, you don't really want her to shake. You want her to pull back. And the way you do that is just to pull her towards you a little bit and then let a slight amount of pressure off. And when that slight amount of pressure comes off, she'll know she's winning and she'll continue in that pursuit of pulling, pulling, pulling. Um, the dog shaking the toy can be fun and exciting, but it can also turn into a problem because the dog will just start thrashing, whether you're, you know, it's a tug toy or the, you know, the sleeve or whatever. 
you really want the dog to bite, hold with a firm grip, and then just tug, tug, tug. There's, shaking shouldn't be part of it, but putting pressure on it, holding pressure, and then you slightly letting go so the dog sees that they can win usually lets the dog see that this is what I should be doing. So you have to teach the dog what they should be doing oftentimes. Um, okay, I'm going to do this, Dennis, but you've got to put question marks in front of your question. Um, let's see, Grant, uh, training videos now, Grant is more focused. Well, that's excellent. And uh, at one time chose to come to me instead of the puppy. Which, that's awesome. What is the next step in the recall? Well, the next step of the recall is just to continue that, right? You want the dog to have a perfect recall if the dog gets it without distractions and we start introducing distractions slow, but we must always be able to correct the dog. So whether that is by going up to him, grabbing him, pulling him back, or whether that is by um, having a long line, being able to pull him in. Until the recall is proofed, and even after the recall is proofed, you must always have the ability to correct the dog back to you. That, that's it. Just keep keep going. That's it. Sherry says, Hi, Robert and Janet. How long does puberty last? My German Shepherd, Oak, Oakley, has started testing me since puberty started trying to get away with things he has been trained in. He's 17 months old. Well, at this point, 18 months, you know, it's always that 9 to 18 month window that I, I mentioned, talk about. Um, that's kind of uh, puberty, you know, the end of puberty and uh, the beginning of adolescence, which you're going to go through until he's about 36 months old. Um, but stay on the dog. Don't allow the dog to um, get away with things because this, when he's testing you is when you really need to make sure the dog understands that you're in charge and that everything is fair. Nick, when I come home from work, Oscar jumps on me and ends up getting me in the face with his head. I ignore him until he settles down. What else do you suggest? He gets excited after. He still gets excited at this. Um, I would have, when he would, if I would walk in the door, he's jumping, I would just stand still. I wouldn't do anything because, or tell him. If he's got a solid down command, then when you walk in the door, ignore him for a second. As soon as he comes close to you, say, down. And then praise him in the down. If he doesn't have that kind of command, then I would just I would almost walk past him. I would come in, I'd stand still for a second. If he starts jumping, I would just walk right past, I'd blow past him as fast as I could, and just ignore him and and see if he's going to start offering up a better behavior. Um, you 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 must have the dog in some kind of control. I know if I come in, the dogs are excited, but they won't jump on me like that. They know um, that I'm not going to allow that, but I'm also going to correct for it so I can say sit or down or whatever when I first walk in and they'll get that and then they get their attention. It, usually that stuff happens when you walk in the door, you go, oh, puppy, you know, or hey, goofy, or hey, whatever. Um, the dog gets really excited and starts to try to buy into that. Really, when I walk in the door, my first thing is to get inside, say hi to Janet, you know, put my stuff down and kind of go on my day. I don't really greet my dogs when I walk in the door because I try not to make an issue out of the dog um, uh, you know, seeing me coming and going as, as being some kind of an event. I think that's real important. Thank you, Lois. Yes, please put a question mark before your questions. That's a very big help. Thank you. Sylvia, and you listen, how do you split your time to train more than one dog? Is it good to do both at the same time? No, it's not good to do both at the same time. You really want to train one dog at a time. And when I do that, now I'm not really training any dog because Goofy is, you know, too old and so is Maya. So Janet's doing training with Dwayne until, you know, I get a puppy. There's not going to be any real training per se. But I do play with them and do some, you know, little routines in the yard. And when I do that, I take Goofy out. Maya stays inside. Maya usually wears a bark collar. She gets way too excited. And um, and then I work with Goofy. I, I, all my focus is on him. And I usually set a clock on my, my watch, a timer. And I say, you know, set a timer for eight minutes or 10 minutes or five minutes, whatever I want to do at that time. And then when I'm done with that, I kind of wrap it up. I put Goofy inside, and Maya comes out. You want to kind of make sure, now Janet's able to have Jimmy sitting next to her, but, but Jimmy's a very well-trained dog, and, and Dwayne and Jimmy's she labs are very different. Labs are trained really in the field where they have to honor another dog or guide dogs. You know, it's this different type of dog. Shepherds don't really work well being idle while another dog is active. That's why in sports like IGP, Part of the test is having the dog on a long down while the other dog is doing obedience near them. So, um, yeah, split the dogs up for sure. Okay, BD, um, you already asked me a question, but I'm going to give you another one. Have you ever thought about doing episode on Rescue Malin? Well, there's some great organizations doing great work for the breed out there. Yeah, there is actually, and at some point I probably will. Um, hi, Janelle. Hi, Tian, uh, Tiana. Cat, cat, okay, and Jamie. Here we go. 
Jamie D'Angelo says, I have a three-year-old lab. Recently, she started barking at people and dogs. Since she is bigger ahead, bigger ahead, since she is bigger ahead, had a deep bark in the car, her bark sounds more aggressive. I, I don't know if that's a question or not. I don't understand the, um, I mean, I don't let my dogs bark at other dogs. That's, if that's what you're asking me, I, I immediately stop it. I either walk in the other direction, I tell them to sit, I tell them to be quiet. Um, and the one thing you really want to focus on is when your dog is fixated on another dog, and I see this in my neighborhood all the time, and it's really important that you guys know this because you can listen to me, and I don't think you guys live in my neighborhood. But if your dog is fixated on, a, on, on another dog walking by, don't sit your dog. Don't have your dog sitting there and staring at the dog. Move your dog. Movement relieves stress. A dog that's barking at another dog is usually in a stressful situation in their mind. The only way to really fix that is to have the dog moving. And when you move them, then sit them, then he gets fixated, then move them, then sit them. That movement will relieve the stress instead of barking and lunging, right? So if you have the dog sitting and he's just, he's just building and building and building, and then he just blows up and barks, you have nowhere to go with the dog and you're being really unfair to the dog. So be sure you um, have the dog moving and, and, and relieving their stress that way. Okay, an Indian says, I own a Belgian Malinois. She is one and a half years. She is a good dog. She's very aggressive with strangers. How do I work around that? Well, she's not a good dog if she's aggressive with strangers. I, I just want, I'm not picking on you or picking on your dog. You have to be honest with yourself because when you say, oh, she's a really, really good dog, except for this, that's, you're, 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 you're misguided in your assessment of your dog. Your dog is acting out in an aggressive way, and that needs to be fixed. So when, when that's fixed, she'll be a good dog, and she's probably an, uh, she probably has nice traits. But if she's aggressive with strangers, you need to build her confidence. You need to build her reliance on you, her focus to you, and then you can um, get the dog to be a really good dog. But that's going to work through obedience. The dog needs to know a solid sit, a solid down, a solid recall, a solid leave it. And those are the ways. People always want to fix aggression by working on aggression. The first way you fix aggression is by building a relationship with you. You don't just start bumping a dog on an e-collar or yanking them around. That dog must have a relationship with you. The video I just put up of Max, and people said, oh, you know, you're still working with Max. Well, that video is over a year old. Max is completely fine now. Max can be around other dogs and around other people, and I've got tons of videos coming of that. But a lot of times you're seeing things... Um, as, as they go, because I'm trying to be somewhat chronological in the videos I post so that you can see that. But, um, but it's all about relationship first. Max knows me. Max understands who I am. Um, he understands who his dad is. So when, that, when a correction then comes, the dog does understand that it's as a result of his violating that trust or that relationship. So, oh, we got some from Facebook. So now I know Facebook is working. I'm glad you uh, came in here to tell me that. So dog trainer... Um, and I'm only doing this because you're the only Facebook person I saw yet. So I'm glad the, the Facebook is working. The question says, or comment says, I'm a dog trainer. And look on a very shy dog. She is eating out of my hand, barks and runs away and so on. Any advice do I have to impose myself on her, put a leash on to go for a walk? Well, you can. But right now, again, this is the same thing. You want to build a relationship first. And if you're training, you were hired to train this dog, you need to kind of build a fair relationship. So you'd want to tell the client not to feed the dog until you come and you'd want to be a part of that, that training. But remember, the, the critical, critical thing in dog training as a dog trainer is it's not your job to get that dog to be okay with you. It's your job to get that dog to understand how to be okay with the owner. And that's imperative. People always miss that. It's one pet peeve of mine with dog trainers. They put the dog on a leash and they go, see what I can do? And... That's not the point. Whenever you see me doing that in a lesson, you'll see me doing that to show the potential of the dog. And then I hand the dog back over to the client because I don't live with you. I don't own that dog. So it doesn't matter that the dog is good with me only for the reason to show that the dog can be good. Because if the dog can't be good with me or you, now we've got a behavior in the dog. Most often dogs are as a result of the relationship between the owner and the dog. So it's misguided because dogs are domesticated. Dogs are pretty fine. But if they assume a position, for example, protectiveness or submission, um, anything to the extreme, then the dog has different behaviors that we need to kind of rewire. But if it's just a misguided uh, relationship between the dog and the person, it's usually an easy thing to fix because you can tell the person how to act. So 
That would be my thing. Um, okay, and Andre, you have a quick question, but you don't have a question mark. I'm going to give it to you this time. This is going to be the very last question I'm going to do um, without a question mark. Question mark before the question. Um, got two Huskies, one year, six months old. The older one sometimes bites too hard when playing with me. It only happens when he's when he's too excited. Should I calm him or do you have another tip? I would calm him. That's it. You know, I mean, first of all, a dog shouldn't be biting you. Right. That's the number one thing you must understand with dogs. Dogs do not have a right to put their teeth on your skin, even in a playful manner. That's that's um, that's because if they learn that. Right. That's the way they play with each other. But they must play differently with us than they play with each other. It's as ridiculous for them to put their mouth on you to tug as for you to expect the dog to take the tug with his paws and tug. Right. It's 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 it's, it's misguided. The dog has to play with you in the way that's dictated by the rules. That means he's allowed to play, put a, ba a ball in his mouth or a tug in his mouth or something like that, but he's not allowed to put your skin in his mouth and play with you. That's just bad. It's, he's going to end up doing it on the wrong person, an older person or a younger child, and you're going to have a problem. So you need to fix that right away. From now on, it's only going to be hi from the Netherlands. Good. People who have a question mark in front of their question. So if you don't have a question mark for your question, I will not answer it. I've got to get to the next ones. Um, and if you've asked a question already, I'll probably, you know, try to go on so that everybody gets a fair chance. Like I said, there's, what is it, 222 people in the room now. So I want to make sure I get to all of you. You're all very, very important to me, and I want to get as much dog training information across to you as I can. Uh, and if you just joined, remember my website, robertcabral.com. That's where you can get tons of dog training videos, lessons. Um, we also have the Shelter Dog Training Program course there, which is uh, an amazing course. It's 25-plus hours, and 150 lessons that, that I think you'd really love. Hollis's question is, difference between Velcro healing and crowding, have an AKC um, utility dog, so and Husky, and get points off for crowding. Well, um, th that's just going to be touch healing. So you need to get the dog to, to be away from you. And a lot of times, AKC um, people I've seen do it. They take a brush and they, they strap it to their leg so when the dog bumps against it, um, it pushes the dog away. However, um, the way I would do this, and I saw uh, my friend Frank Phillips talk about it too, is I would take the dog and pull him into you more. So in other words, dogs focus on what's called an opposition reflex. So if you keep pulling the dog out away from you with your left hand to try to get the dog to pull away from you, he's going to pull into that more, so he's going to heal more. So the way I've seen it fixed and the way I've fixed it and the way I think it would be the best way to do it is to, when he's touching you, take the leash and pull him more into you. And then when he straightens out, praise him, right? You want to get him into that position. The other thing you can do too is if he's, the dog is young enough is you can take a treat and focus getting the dog's head up. Like, so in other words, you want the head up, not to the side. And a lot of times when we start uh, working on healing with dogs, we end up having our hand in a position where it pulls the dog's head across our bodies. And then that's, that's the problem. And that's a huge issue. So uh let's see that was hollis okay rick now you got a lot of question marks i like that we are getting a 12 week old black german shepherd monday best way to introduce her to our almost two-year-old female german shepherd and the best way always 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 is by using a crate if you use a crate you'll get the dog um to be trans you know the, the, the new dog will see the, the thing and i always use a wire crate um will see the world and see his home and see all this stuff um, and the older dog, your current dog, will see that this dog is not imposing on him and that there's structure. Um, make sure you have good, solid obedience and good structure on your other dog so that you can call the dog off. But, but you know, for the first week, I, I really allow the dogs to be in that position. You'll see they, they settle down, even if they're growling or barking at each other in the beginning. Remember, shepherds play kind of roughly. Like they'll, they'll, you, the dog will definitely probably put the puppy's head in, in, in his mouth, um, hopefully in a friendly way. And, uh, and that's just how they play and, and, and establish the, their structure. So, Okay, you guys on Facebook are not getting the question mark um, issue, but I'm going to do it because I want to make sure you get Facebook people don't feel like you're ignored because there's so many YouTube people here. Uh, you have a Dogo pup. How long should I wait before I put her in a training program? I've heard anything before six months is a waste of time and money. I would strongly disagree with that, Luke. Strongly disagree. I think the dog should be in a training program to start learning things at eight weeks old. I mean, the sooner you can get the dog to learn how to learn, the better it is for the dog. So you need to get the dog into a training program uh, right away. Because when the dog is six months old, the dog has already formed certain habits. Now, protection stuff where, where it's going to press on the dog's nerves, you might wait because you want to have confidence in the dog and maturity. 
but um, but most stuff, no, I would definitely, definitely, de- definitely um, get the dog into a training program. And Allison says, my Mal has suddenly decided she wants to kill cats. This is after next door's cat got into our garden. She lives happily with our house cat, but she now has real determination to absolutely kill any other feline. I'm not sure how to deal with it as she's very trying to get over um, a six foot garden fence to kill. Well, th- this is part of the nature of a Mal. It's that incredible, insane prey drive. And you're going to need to do some avoidance training so the dog understands that that is not acceptable because a Malinois will get over a six-foot fence without any any issue at all. If you look at uh, Belgian ring uh, videos, you can see a Mal can get to 2.2 meters, which is over eight feet, right? That's that's or seven feet. Um, you must must g- g- do some avoidance on that dog. Okay, question marks, Jana. Jana says, hi, Robert, what are your views on uh, the Doberman breed? I'm, there are some people breeding really nice Dobermans now. I mean, I, I never really have an issue with the breed. I always have an issue with um, the breeding. Like, are they good dogs? Are they genetically testing the dogs? Are they, are they screening the dogs? Are they looking for um, stable temperaments and stuff like that? And there are some really nice Dobermans. I've seen some really crappily bred Dobermans over the years. Um, they were good for a while. They went to crap for a while, and they seem to be coming back up um, much better. So, um, really, you want to check. You know, what are the parents like? What are the genetics like on the dog? What are they breeding for? Are they breeding for temperament? They should, and a, dog, a breeder should breed for temperament and confirmation. Like you don't want just a really nice temperament dog that has really bad confirmation and has bad hips, bad elbows, uh, bad top line, or anything like that. You want a dog that has both, and a good breeder really focuses on both, right? You, you, you must, must, must look at that. But definitely don't get somebody who's just breeding dogs for confirmation because then they might look great and be physically very healthy, but they're not mentally healthy. So that fine line between the two is, is in, incredible. Um, okay, Crystal says... What joint supplement do you give your dogs, Robert? I don't really give my dog one. I know Janet does give um, Dasequin, and I gave Dasequin for years to my other dogs. Um, my dogs don't really have any issues. I, I do a mixture of what's called golden paste, and that stops inflammation. And a good diet with fish oils and stuff like that, I think, really helps a dog with um, inflammation in the joints. But there's, I don't think there's anything that's going to really repair the cartilage on an older dog. You're really looking for, um, you know, a solid diet that's high in fats um, will help the dog to uh, be healthy and to have a healthy diet. And um, once you uh, get that, then, the, you know, if the dog has some inflammation because the dog is older, then I do focus on trying to get the dog some, um, uh, what, what I just, golden paste, which you can find the recipe for online. Sabine says, would you say it's easier to introduce an adult dog or a puppy to an existing three-year-old dog in the home when getting a second dog? It, it depends on the temperament. Like, you know, you might get an older dog who's just really nice, who just really loves to, um, you know, loves to play with other dogs. But you might also get a dog that doesn't, a dog that's just not friendly to other dogs. And then, then you got a problem. So, you really want to make sure you, you, you get a dog with a solid temperament. Now, puppies usually are more moldable, more easy. It depends. Really, if your dog's really bulletproof and really nice and really sweet, then I would probably go with a puppy because that's going to give you <clears throat> the best chance of success at it. And you know the dog's not going to have any really bad problems. Um, you Facebook people are not getting the memo on question marks, so I'll answer this one. Um, okay, well, maybe you didn't even have a question. How about that? There we go. Sparky says, um, my dog is seven years old. I've trained her with your video. She will become a senior dog next year. Can you please give me tips on how to make her training more fun and interesting? Well, it's, it's you, right? It's your personality. It's your energy that you bring to the table. It's how you start the training out. You start the training out by saying, hey, get over here. Put a collar on. Hey, sit, heal. Because that's not fun, right? Everything I do with um, my dogs when I'm training, is it always, it always, always, always has some kind of reward. I either have treats with me or or ball with me or something. And that's not saying I'm luring or rewarding everything, but the dogs know that it's going to be fun. So Goofy goes to a certain area of the house here and he'll know that you know his two favorite balls are, are laying there and he'll go stand right by him and look. And when I pick them up, he runs outside and he's ready to, he's on because he knows we're going to have fun. And I always make it fun. I go, well, you want to play? You want to go train? You want to go train? Let's go. Come on, come on, come on, let's go. 
then that energy in the in the um, experience and in in the routine keeps the dog having fun. But as a dog gets older, I mean, Goofy's twelve and a half now. He's actually sleeping over here. Um, he, um, you know, he, he's not going to do as much jumping or running or skidding and stuff like that, which is hard. With a Malinois, it's very, very, very hard. Um, Sweden, nice to see you. Um, South Africa, nice to see you. Hong Kong, look at that. I mean, everywhere. You guys are just, I'm flattered. I just love, love, love seeing you guys from all over the world here to train your dogs and you get good dog training information. That's, this is the power of social media, right? I mean, as much as I complain about social media and I say I hate it because it wastes so much time, and it does, I think it taxes your time. I and mean, it's a beautiful day outside. I hope you do these lives with me and then you get out of here and go do something outside with your dog or your husband or wife or boyfriend or girlfriend or mother or father or your friends. Um, because just sitting on social media is really, really ridiculous. It's just a complete time suck of your life. Don't, don't do it. Um, Gemmeroids says, I have a 10-month-old Mally. We are having problems with her reactivity in the car. We're working on her reactivity on walks with a slip lead and long line with some progress. Any tips? Yeah, if she's in the car, I would put a bark collar on her. And Maya was reactive in the car, put a bark collar on her, and she just got it. She just really dialed in and became a really nice, easy dog. So that's my opinion. I would definitely use a bark collar because it gives you a really good shot at it. Okay, Tiana, thank you so much for uh, putting the question marks. What advice do you have on how to make a career change into dog training? How would you pl price How would you price while being a novice to more expertise level of training? Well, first of all, Tiana, get a lot of experience with different dogs, whether you're going to shadow somebody or whether you're going to go volunteer to rescue or shelter. Um, you know, my dog training, my course, the course of um, the shelter dog training course has an immense amount of information. There's some good dog training courses out there. There's some really, really bad ones. I see, I tend to think mine is one of the best ones, especially for the price. But um, you need to learn a lot about behavior. Now, a lot of this stuff you can find for free. Obviously, you can find almost everything for free on the internet, but then you need to decipher between what's good and what's bad. So you need to have a firm grasp on the theory of dog training. You need to understand how dogs think, how dogs work, how dogs respond. Um, and then you need to have a good grasp on the tactical side of dog training. But you, you, know, you must love dogs. You must have compassion for dogs. And then you must have the skills. Um, pricing, I mean, it's not really... I mean, it depends where you're located. I mean, I would obviously price myself a little bit lower and say, hey, you know, I'm only going to take on basic uh, um, behaviors, you know, like like maybe puppy stuff or luring and shaping stuff, because that's all easy to do once you understand it. Problem solving is a lot more involved, and I would just leave those for later and maybe even find a dog trainer uh, or two in your area and say, hey, do you ever get, you know, an overflow of clients where it's just simple puppy stuff or dog stuff? I can, I'd like to take those for you. And you can give the person a little kickback or something, or they might just want to farm it out. I farm out, I farm out more dog training than I take because I just don't really take that much. And there's probably plenty of trainers who are overbooked, especially now. But, um, but get the information. Again, my dog training course, the shelter dog training, would really help you. Um, so that, that, that would be my first step. And good luck to you. You know, please consider joining my site and keep me posted on your progress. I always love hearing that. Um, Hazel, we have a one-year-old pit husky mix. She has suddenly become head shy around people she doesn't know. Is there something we can do to get her to relax? Well, one thing I would do is I would make sure that nobody is petting her on the head, uh, especially since she's head shy, because when the dog has that suspicion and then they feel the physical pressure that brings out that suspicion or that, or that confirms that suspicion, the dog will do you know, a bad behavior. It'll either run behind you and be fearful or it will strike out and, and bite to protect itself. What I would probably do in the beginning is I would get the dog around other people and I'd have the people there and then I would pet the dog's head because it shows the dog um, the trust to you in the presence of the suspicion. And then later um, I would start along. As she's very, very, very comfortable with me doing it, I would have people that I know really well that she's seen around doing it. And then working there. But remember, here's this is the this is the caveat. This is the all the money. This is worth everything right here. Your dog does not to be pet does not need to be pet on the head by anyone but you. In fact, I can't even remember the last time somebody that wasn't me or Janet petted one of my dogs on the head. It just doesn't happen. You know, maybe rarely somebody say, Can I say hi to your dogs? And I'll say, Yeah, goofy, sit, say hi. But it's not it's not a requirement for your dog. Maybe your vet. That's it. 
Everyday Man says hello from Texas. Our three-year-old Roddy is amazing, but still excited. Submissive P sometimes, how do I help him with confidence? Confidence in a dog is always going to be what makes the dog feel they're succeeding, right? So something they're very, very, very good at. If the dog is very, very good at like sitting pretty, then when the dog is feeling insecure, I say, hey, sit pretty. And they do, and I go, yeah, what a good boy, because it's something they love to do, something they succeed at every time, and something that they're going to get rewarded for abundantly. Now, submissive peeing or piddling, like I call it, is oftentimes the result of overexcitement as well. So the dog gets super, super excited, doesn't know what to do themselves. And it usually happens more with females. I don't know if um, oh, you have a, a male. So it's usually a female issue. Uh, but what I would do is the number one thing would be tell people not to get overly excited around the dog. Tell the dog people to be really neutral, get the dog really used to that neutrality around other people, and that will start to calm that part down. The more excited the dog is, the more likely they are to pee because it's a contraction of the bladder and the stomach muscles that, that causes that. So um, that would be what I would do. Let's see. Okay, you took on a, shell, a shy shelter dog advice. Training, obedience, you know, obedience training. That's really, really, really it. Um, Osama. I have a Malinois who has been abused heavily. They allow German shepherds to attack him while he was on muzzle. I mean, whoever does that should be shot. That's really, really terrible. After I rescued him, he appeared to show aggressiveness towards other dogs. And of course he would. Um, and some occasions on kids riding scooters, can this be adjusted or fixed? It can be, but what you really, really need to focus on is doing it safely, right? You cannot put this dog in a situation where they're going to fail. So you need to get this dog completely neutral in a controlled situation um, around this scenario, whether that scenario is um, the, 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 the kids on the scooters or whatever. The dog must learn to be neutral. So move those distractions, those those those. Um, those triggers away from the dog far enough away where the dog feels like, okay, you know what, I, this is safe. And the dog will become more and more neutral, then start to bring them closer, but always maintain control of the dog, especially when you're dealing with, with children. You definitely don't want the dog to be um, hurt. Oh, now, Kim, you are the very, very first person from Facebook who put question marks. And now I know you guys heard it, so now I can only take question marks from Facebook as well. Thanks for doing that. Um, my two-year-old course who has not met many dogs actually up close. Uh, what's the best way you suggest to do that? She's seen lots of them, but not actually meeting. Well, first of all, again, I always say your dog doesn't need to meet them, right? Your dog only needs to be neutral. So the fastest and easiest way to do that is to get your dog to learn to walk by them, to come back to you when she gets close to them, closer to them. And then, you know, at, at some point she can meet them. But the, the more good experiences she has without failing, the better she's going to do when she finally meets them. And I would say the dog she meets should be absolutely neutral, solid, solid dogs so that you don't end up having a dog that's, you know, going to give her a bad experience, especially the very, very first time. Gil, uh, what do I do if a dog won't let me put a collar on him? He growls. I already answered that question early on. You might want to rewind the, the, the tape. I don't want to spend too much time on that. Uh, Linda says, what can I do to calm an Aussie down in agility? He does... He does fine starting off with jumps and tunnels. Then he starts barking, jumping around, wanting to play. How can I help him with this behavior? Well, any, and this doesn't matter, but, but whether it's agility or anything, you, you want to, the dog is just getting wound up, wound up, wound up. So my position to you would be to put more fun and structure into it and also stop the dog. In other words, if the dog does fine on three jumps or three um, obstacles, let's say, then I would have the dog do three obstacles and have the dog come back, go, good boy, good boy, and then start again, then go to four obstacles. Because I think the dog is just getting wound up into that drive and then you're not able to do anything about it because then he's just running around. It's going to go back to, you know, if you're doing it, obviously in a class, you can do it. Call the dog back, sit. Okay, one, two, three, four, good boy, come here, sit. Then boom, boom, boom. And then you can even have the dog sitting in between the obstacles. Like you can have the dog do two jumps, sit. Okay, good. Now let's focus over here. Boom. Because once the dog loses focus and gets into that crazy, excitable state, that's where I think you're going to have the, big, the biggest issues with your dog. Okay, Sally, how do I get started on dog training? What are my first steps? Well, the first steps is to learn the basics about dog behavior, dog theory, and dog, you know, 
dog basic dog training. You can do that by visiting my website, robertcabral.com, and checking on the shelter dog training course. It's a 25-hour, 150-lesson course that's half lecture and half hands-on dog training. It will give you everything you need to know to understand how to be a dog trainer. It does not in any way explain the business of dog training to you. That's something you have to figure out. And you're, the way you figure it out is I never took a course. I never asked any questions on how to be a dog trainer, the business of it. I just started doing a really good job and my business grew. And that is an organic way to do it. I don't believe in over marketing early on when you're trying to train your dog or be a dog trainer because um, you, need to, you need to cut your teeth on becoming and on dealing with dogs first. So, um, but I would, I would do that. I would, you know, I would consider my course in dog, uh, at the shelterdogtraining.com. Dennis says, when doing the leave it training, is it possible to allow your dog to get, say, a water bottle and say, leave it if he picks up another bottle that is dirty or still has liquids in it? Um, no, I, I think it's too confusing for the dog, right? You want to bring the dog to a place and you want to say, you know, like that's like if I do a directional retrieve, like the dog, go get that. But if he goes here, I say, no, get that um, and, and redirect him. But if you have two bottles there and he gets one and he picks up the other one, you, you know, what's different about the one that you're telling him to pick up and the other one? Have you put your scent on it? Because then if you put your scent on it, then you can say no. But I wouldn't say leave it. I would just say no, this one. Um, it's it's the, the theory of putting too heavy of a correction on a dog for trying, right? You can just say, uh-uh, uh-uh, that's not it. Mm -mm, nope, 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 nope. But a harsh no or, you know, leave it is too much emotionally on the dog to, to want to continue um, with the training. Um, I already answered that question, Sherry. Jack, can positive-only training claim to be ethical? No, because positive-only training doesn't exist, right? Um, by removing all consequence from a dog, you, you can't train them, right? So positive-only, is it's, it's a cult because it's giving you, it's saying to you something that isn't really true. So if someone who is going to be positive-only they would always give the dog a treat. They wouldn't withhold a treat because that's a form of consequence. If um, positive only uh, people, you, they wouldn't use a leash because that's a consequence. A dog can't get around, can't get away. Um, positive only wouldn't do things like putting spatial pressure on a dog because that's a, that's a consequence. Um, so positive only, the, the problem I have with this, again, I, I am a positive dog trainer. I'm a balanced dog trainer. I use a, tons of rewards. But the, the problem is they're just not telling you the consequences that are really actual consequences, like withholding food or, you know, spatial pressure or, you know, a, a leash, you know, letting a dog go to the end of a, f uh, of a, of a flexi leash and saying that's positive, but an e-collar isn't. So um, I think it's a lie. I think it's, a, I think it's very unethical positive only because it, it does lie to the clients um, in, in telling them that there is no, there is no consequence. That's just my, my, my two cents. <clears throat> Marcia says, how do I get my seven-month-old giant schnauzer to keep his mouth shut, be less mouthy and nippy when working with his head front area? When working with his head front area. I, are you saying like for grooming or anything like that? I mean, you just need to get the dog used to it. I think that's going to be a really important piece that the dog must understand what you're doing and that that is a fair thing that you're allowed to do. You are allowed to do whatever you need to do to your dog. And now I say that with, with a little bit of um, reluctance because I would never say someone should be able to abuse their dog. But that being said, you must understand the difference between abuse and things you need to do. For example, your dog needs to get a vaccine at the vet. The dog might scream and might thrash and not want that, but the dog must get that vaccine. Um, you must be able to groom your dog's nails and you must be able to palpate your dog. You must be able to take your dog's paw in your hand. And if he doesn't like that, he must be okay with that. Because if the dog gets something, a, a snake bite, a, a stinger, a, you know, or a thorn in his foot, and you can't handle his foot, and he's going to bite you for handling his foot, you got bigger problems than you could possibly imagine. So you must be able to control your dog and handle your dog. So, you know, I would just, it's going to be through um, attrition. You're going to get the dog to let you do it, and then you're going to, and if the dog doesn't, you're going to have to work through that. Like with um, Maya and Goofy and Dwayne, everybody except for Jimmy, I had to work through considerably to let, and even to this day, I have to hold their paws to trim their nails, and sometimes they pull away, and I say, no, we're going to do this. And this is years and years down the line, but they, they don't bite. That's, that's the obvious part. Okay. 
That was Marsha. Let's see. Um, I don't know why you guys are not putting question marks on. I have a four-year-old, roughly collie cross spaniel rescue from Romania. I've had him for a few years. We still have a big issue with him barking when he hears random noises, even sometimes at nothing. We have seen a behavior specialist and spoke about reducing his stress levels, but looking for looking for further advice. Um, if the dog is very normal, the dog isn't overly sensitive, you can consider using a bark collar. I mean, I, I use it on my dogs. It's very ethical. It's no problem with it. Um, you want to introduce it properly by starting it off with just wearing it, then starting it off at a very, very, very low tickle level, um, and then bringing it up. But um, if nothing works, you know, behaviors and all that, they're going to have a bunch of stuff that you don't really need to look at from there. Okay, now here's a super chat. Thank you for the super, super chats. I sometimes don't see the super chats, but I do thank you for them. Um, from Zuzu David, I am bringing home a new Belgian Malinois puppy in October. How should I go about socializing with my year-old female Siberian Husky? Super simple. The puppy goes in a crate. The puppy spends most of the time in the crate around the other dog. You need to get your, your puppy out and you know, socialize him, uh, train him, work on a good structure, good bonding and stuff like that. But when the puppy is um, first in the house, he's in a crate. The puppy sees the, the, the Husky, the... Um, it is a husky, yes, Siberian husky. Um, the the puppy, the husky sees the puppy, and they all, you know, everything's fine. You you want to make sure that your your big dog always comes first, um, always, always, always structure, structure, structure first, and then you know slowly start to introduce them, bring them out for a walk together, bring the puppy out, let the let the let the, the, the husky sniff them and, and and play with them a little bit, but keep it very short because the the Malinois will have. Um, a lot more dominance than the husky. The husky will have a, a lot more drive early on, but then they'll they'll meet together and they'll. they'll should be a good match. And thank you for the super chat, by the way. Matt says, we have a nine-week-old mini cockapoo. Crate chain is going well at night, but is a, is a scream fest. She is put in for short sessions during the day. How do we, do we just let her scream? Yes, you, you have to. You have to, You the more, let's say she does it for five minutes and then you go, okay, I can't take it anymore. And you take her out. The next time she'll do it for six, seven, eight minutes and then it'll be 10 minutes and then 20 minutes, she'll keep going. You kind of have to let the dog work through that um, by attrition. It's the only way it's going to work. Now, there's the smallest, smallest percentage that you won't do it, but 99% of dogs do fine in the crate. Um, okay, Sylvia Gutierrez, um, what's the best way to calm down a puppy on high drive? Well, in the witching hour, it's impossible. My four-month-old bully starts running and biting me really hard when she, and ignores toys. Um, be careful during that witching hour, right? Because you, you don't, especially a young puppy like this, this is totally normal. They start flying around the yard of the house. Um, those are times you just kind of grab them and say, okay, go in the crate, and then you, know, and you just kind of ignore them. You need to control the dog during those times, and, and you know when they're coming, right? You already know that. So when you see it start, take the dog and say, come on, we're going to go in the crate and calm down and then take them out again. And when you take them out, put them on a leash and have some kind of structure because you want to be able to control that, especially with a bully. He's going to get, he's going to get really dominant on you. Jamie says, my lab is barking at dogs and people more it's worse in the car. In the car, put a, make sure the dog's in a crate. Put a bark collar on the dog. That will that will fi fix that. Um, what's going to be the best, most ethical way to manage and train frustrated greeter dog? What's going to be the most ethical way to manage and train a frustrated greeter dog in an apartment setting? Uh, that's your second question. So I'm going to tell you: structure, place command, good solid obedience. Um, my trainer wants me to poke my dog by surprise when he has no attention for me while healing. Is that a good method? It's not a bad method, you know. Um, but poking the dog sometimes might make the dog want to be further away from you. So I just use a tone. I go, hey, hey, hey. And when they look, then I have a reward, a toy, a treat or something like that. And then I've got the engagement and then I focus on it. So the the poking, the, the, the danger you have with the dog is if the dog is kind of sharp shy or kind of really nervy, the dog will then, um, when you poke them, they go away from you, and now you got to bring the dog back into you. So it teaches the dog to, to, to push away from you. You want I would walk away from the dog, go, hey, hey, and then um, the dog would come into you. That, that's the way I would do that. Damien, I'm kind of running out of time here. I only got one more. I can only take one more question because I've got to get onto um, a live for members. So if you're not a member of RobertCabral.com and you want to um, continue this conversation. If you join there, you know, there's, a, there's a member live going on. As soon as I jump out of here, I jump into that one. 
um, and you get two hours of me. Every time I do a live on YouTube, I do an, a live on uh, my member section. So you want more live? Um, join my member section. It's a bargain, 14 bucks a month, I think fourteen ninety five a month. And you get a lot of great benefits. Sorry uh, for my English. I have a roddy puppy nine weeks, and he is very <coughs> biting. I can't even pet him. Very biting. It is normal. Toys correct. Yeah, it, it is very normal. You have a working dog. You have a high-energy dog, um, and he's going to want to bite your hands because you're more exciting. So you need to be very, very calm with the dog. You need to give the dog nice downtime. But when you're engaging with the dog, when he's biting, just be very, very, very calm. The calmer you are, the faster you'll solve this problem. Um, and guys, that's going to be my, um, the, I'm sorry, I know there's a ton, ton, a ton of questions um, in here. And I'm so, so, so sorry. I'm just going to scroll through here really quick to see if there's anything. Um, I, I'm so sorry. I feel bad. I can't get there. So many amazing, amazing questions. Um, we'll have to get these next time and I'll do another live coming up soon. Um, I do them usually. Um, here's a super chat. Let's see what this is. I, I hate to leave you super chats out there. Um, what's the best and fairest method to correct a dog that keeps putting his paws on the kitchen counter? One-year-old mixed breed. Um, you know, what you can do is um, you can set up like some, some something up there with that, like a towel that when he pulls it down, you can have some shake hands on or something that'll startle him. You can use a shake hand and throw it on the ground behind him when he does it. Um, sometimes what I'll do is I'll take my knuckle and I'll just tap them on their, on their paws. Um, not hard, not to hurt them or not to hurt their paws, but something to show them that th there's displeasure with that. Like I always take them and say, oh, no, you can't do that. Oh, no, you can't do that. Then you're going to end up with a dog that's um, doing it to engage with you. So um, that's what I would do. That I would I would definitely tap him on his, on his toes um, or try to find another way. I'm just looking through here because if you guys did do a super chat, I hate to not answer you. I'm not ignoring um, you at all. Guys, consider going over to robertcabral.com clicking on the join button, joining up, you'll get another hour of me um, in the member. And by the way, the member live that I do right after this, I get every single question answered. I, I promise you I do because there's not as many people in there. Here we have what, 213, we had 250 people at one point. Um, almost impossible for me to get to all the answers. So I hope you do benefit from listening to my answers to other people because there is immense benefit in that. And also these lives are put on, they're archived on YouTube. So you can always come back and reference them uh, for future reference with with Q, Q and A's and you know and try to get in earlier on the next one. I'm sorry, it's and uh, it's the best I can do for you guys. But if you're not a member, head over to the member section and uh, God bless all of you. Thank you for allowing me to be part of your dog training experience. Um, I value that very very greatly. I I love helping you train your dogs. It's my favorite favorite thing in the world, uh, besides training my dogs. Um, but I love helping other people with their dogs. So I hope to see you uh, in the member live. I'm going to head over there in about one minute. And uh, God bless you, and I'll see you in the next live.